Good afternoon. It's, it's uh, interesting to see the level of energy at 4.15. I mean, I must say the speakers before and the panels before have done their job. And uh, I always worry a little because at this time people start to think, should I be thinking about uh, what's beyond the curb or should I be thinking about uh, where the coffee is? But nonetheless, we are talking about rebrain or rot. And so I was uh, initially perplexed as to why I was asked to talk about beyond the curb. Because the curb is right next to you on the street. And I could have thought about being asked to talk about what's around the corner, what's behind the bend, but just the curb. And then it struck me that the question has been thoughtfully posed. Because the future is not far, and what was behind the bend is now just across the curb. And so <clears throat> it's in this context that I want to actually put out a few thoughts for argumentation. And uh, <clears throat> the four I identify are first, in a world where I'm just going after a panel of startups, is digitization. The second is Asia. The third is democracy. And the fourth is geopolitics. And what is it amongst this which is causing for us to have to look differently at everything that's going around. Because all of what we assumed and took for granted is now under challenge. So if I was to just ask all of you, how many cell phones did you think there were in India in 2000? Any guesses? 2000, not so long ago, 19 years ago. You were all alive. No. 3.6 million. Can you believe that? 3.6 million phones in just 2000. In 2000, if you had a cell phone, it reinforced your class. You were upper class. In 2019, when there are 813 million phones, it is an equalizer. And it is the weapon of digitization and it is the weapon of big data. And we cannot even imagine a life without it. And I tell you, in 2000, I was 40 years old, so I remember it distinctly. And yet, think about it. We don't know of a life before the cell phone. What will 2039 look like? So there are four major areas that digitization will change our lives. One part of that is becoming evident already. So there will be global scrutiny. There will be market and consumption. There will be challenges from outside your segment. And there will be new business models due to machine learning. But what do I mean? So what I mean is that your only privacy, mark my words, your only privacy is somebody else's disinterest. So if you are uninteresting, you can be private. If you are interesting, you have no privacy. And in fact, and in fact, the wars of the future are not going to be nuclear. They're going to be cyber. And there are five countries already with cyber capability, which can actually cause grievous damage. The US, Russia, China, Israel, and Iran. So this discussion that we are having about what Russia can do in the US elections, trust me, the US can do that too. Cyber is a lethal weapon. And you should know that everything that you do, if you are interesting, is open to instant global intrusive scrutiny. This is a fact. 
this is real, this happens today. Okay? The second issue, which is, which I will go to what the panel was talking about. In emerging markets today, there is a retail spend of $8.5 trillion. Already, $4 trillion is influenced by digital, and $2 trillion is conducted on digital. And to give you a sense of what that is, I'm going to show you three pictures. Corn from Thailand, Shalini from India, and Thuan from China. Corn is a photography enthusiast. He wanted to buy a camera. Any guesses where he bought it? I'm not going to let you all just sleep, you know, I mean, I'm just going to at least ask you to participate. Facebook, any other thoughts? So interesting, actually he did use social media, he was part of a chat group of enthusiasts. And he wanted to know which camera to buy, which Nikon to buy. And over the chat group he discovered that there was somebody who was slightly unhappy with his Nikon. And over discussion, he bought that guy's camera. And uh, he bought it because he knew that he was telling him exactly what he liked and what he didn't like about the camera. So he knew that this was a real uh, 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 an expert telling him. And he also knew that he could actually go back to him to get advice in how to use it. He bought it from him, and he is in touch with him all through. Shalini, so that just imagine how social media is affecting purchase. Shalini is an impulse purchaser. Impulse purchase, when I was growing up in consulting, was what was kept at the counter as you were exiting. Some chocolate, some chewing gum, you know, these were the things that just as you were leaving, on impulse you would pick up. Her impulse purchase is somewhat different. She gets her kids to do homework between 3 and 4 p.m. And between 3 and 4 p.m., she is uh, on her phone buying randomly for that one hour. Her sales actually spike. Her spouse is actually a little bit unhappy with this homework because it's really costing him a lot because it happens every day during 3 to 4, she is buying. And Thuan is actually using the full online and offline experience in purchase. She goes into a mall, tries a dress, takes a picture, puts it on WeChat, sends it to her friends, they tell her a different color would be better. She goes, she texts the store saying, do you have it in this color? And then she goes back and actually tries that dress, gets her hair colored for the party that she's going to go for, the dress will get delivered to her house, and then she will go and check for lipstick and shoes, and that will also get delivered to her house as she has dinner in the mall. This is all happening today. And so I'm just giving you a sense how disruptive, just four uh, picture frames of digitization. You know, on one hand, intrusive scrutiny, and the other hand, purchase, and in the third, death. Death for businesses. So, you know, if you are in a particular business segment, in a particular industry vertical, you know who you think your competition to be is somebody like you. So India today will think of the other news channels as competition, the other magazines as competition. What happens is, when the attack comes from outside the segment, that's when you are least prepared for it. Between 2003 and 2006, trust me, Nokia, Ericsson, Samsung, all knew the patents that Apple had got. The people who did not know the patents that Apple had were the digital cameras. Nikon didn't know. And so what happens is that in 2007, suddenly you have the iPhone 
which starts taking pictures and an industry dies. The digital camera industry dies. And it dies truly by accident because it wasn't even one of the biggest things in that iPhone. It came in through discussion. And that discussion kills an industry. And today, 97% of the pictures that are taken are taken on phones. So just think about it, that how you die from outside industry boundaries. And today, the watch has become a, a, you know, a, an ornament because you don't really need it. You don't really uh, transfer money with demand drafts anymore. Even if you buy a flat, you're not doing that on demand drafts. So just look at how from outside industry boundaries you get killed. This is all happening because of digital. And the speed with which, you know, we hear all this thing about anti-globalization. Actually, Uber, Netflix, they have actually globalized in five, six years what Unilever and PNG did over 80. Because you don't need the setups today to actually globalize at that speed. And then the final killer, the final killer is data. It's data and digital together that destroys you. Because volume and storage is free, almost. You have fields of servers with just data. You have speed, you have enormous computing power, and you have video connectivity. In fact, today, I find that in BCG, we find it harder to hire data engineers than data scientists, the guys who actually organize the data. You know, I, my first career was in the RBI. And when you joined, you used to read this 12-page uh, note on how to file. It was written by a, a guy called Madhav Das. And I said, how can a man be so, so dull to actually write 12 pages on how to file documents in, in, a, in, a, in a folder. And I understood then why his wife, Kamala Das, was such a poet with so much pain in her heart, because if you had a husband like that, you needed to uh, be a poet. But uh, the fact is, today, data engineers are gold, because they allow you to access the data quickly. And so industry after industry is going to be redefined. Trust me. In the next five to seven years, healthcare will be a different game altogether. Where will you have a doctor? Where will you have a doctor and a technician? Where will you have a remote doctor and a technician? Where will you not have a doctor? How will you actually go through this whole process, which is so incredibly inefficient today in India, where a doctor wastes so much time, where today you, don't e you can't even sift through the issues which data can now do. I don't want to, you know, the, the, I always, uh, unfortunately, become senior. So I get other people to make slides. And they make stupid slides like this for a large audience. So I have to apologize. None of us can read this. Neither can I. But the fact of the matter is very simple. The fact is that today, if you were to get skin cancer, it is easier for a machine to detect it than a doctor. You know, it is that level of, of, of you know, having 100 millions of such tests being run iteratively. And so what happens now is, even today the Tatas have in, in Karnataka got a nerve center where they are serving about uh, some 60,000 people remotely because they're having video chats, getting it, they're doing post follow-up uh, of these uh, women who are pregnant, what they are eating before, what they are eating after, their checkups, <clears throat> which they need to come in for, which they don't, when they come in, what they're being checked up for. So just imagine, this whole space is different. This is just digital and data. Then there is this problem, small problem called Asia which is redefining the world. But the institutions haven't kept pace with it. Asia hasn't quite been understood. <clears throat> you know, if you look at this slide, it shows something very different, uh, very simple. The top five countries in per capita and the bottom five countries in per capita. 
the distance was 3 is to 1, 4 is to 1, 6 is to 1, up to 1900. What happens in 2000? It becomes 60 is to 1. <clears throat> so about 700 million people matter. They are US, West Europe, Japan, Australia, New Zealand. And everyone living here doesn't really. Because 60 times, that's the difference. Every country and every company that developed between 1950 and 2000 did it on the back of the American wallet. And now, in 16 years, in 20 years, that's correcting to 16 is to 1. So suddenly, Asia is happening. And Asia is happening in a variety of ways. And I, I don't want to waste time uh, showing you in how many ways it's happening. But the real truth is that in just 2000, 19 years ago, the 17 most populous countries in the world were 20% of just G7 GDP. In 15 years, they have grown three times, 60%. So, in terms of three key areas, consumption, infrastructure, and new companies. Asia is adding the maximum amount of demand. It's also killing one other thing, which is the environment. So the future of the world is actually being determined by Asia, both good and bad. And most companies haven't been able to adjust because of the speed at which this has taken place. And if you look at it, this has led to a sharp reduction in inequality, as I showed you, between countries. You know, 60 is to 1 is coming down to 16 is to 1. But what it hasn't solved is inequality within countries. So this just shows you that in every country that you look at, Russia, India, Thailand, the percentage of wealth in the top 1% is 74%, 58%, 58%. It's always above 40%, the top 1%. And if you take the top 10%, it's always above 70%. This is unsustainable. That level of economic concentration. And what has that done? That has killed the democracy. So if you look at it today, and look at these pictures very carefully, Jair Bolsonaro, Rodrigo Duterte, Emmanuel Macron, Erdogan, Angela Merkel, and of course, most of all, Donald Trump. What do you see? You see that only a challenger is allowed hope. Any incumbent, any incumbent has to actually create polarization on primordial lines to actually re win a, a, a re-election. And the demagogues that are required to do this are actually aided deeply by the social media which allows people to only read the news they like, and on the back of this growing inequality within country. So the, the inequality across countries has now shifted to within countries, and that is making the greatest challenge to democracies across the world. Because I've never seen a time period in recent history where all democracies are functioning so poorly. And then the final issue, is that, you know, long back, uh, I think it was in 1500s, uh, actually in, in the past when Thucydides, Thucydides was writing about the fight between Sparta and Athens, he said it was the rise of Athens and the fear that this instilled in Sparta that made war inevitable. And the rise of Athens is China, Sparta is US. If you look on almost every dimension, the top 10 internet public companies, there are 10, five in the US, five in China. They have the high, highest market cap. You look at economic growth, in the last 15 years, last 18 years, China has grown 11 times. What US took 50 years to do, to go from one trillion to 10 trillion, China did in 15 years. The population, if you add military personnel and nuclear weapons, and you look at the treaty environment, we have a situation today that the world is fundamentally unstable. Multilateralism cannot continue to survive. It is under deep challenge. 
and the implications of this challenge are unclear. So I want to end with a, with a quote from the Dalai Lama, because I think it, it is uplifting in a time when you can you know, either be uplifted or deeply concerned. So if you want to look beyond the curve, I would recommend, like the Dalai Lama, choose to be optimistic. It makes you feel better, if nothing else. Because on the, on the opportunity side, it is clear that digital and data will redefine the world. Anything that can be digitized will be digitized. Any algorithm that can be used will be used. Let's just accept that. Platforms will have the greatest power, and the nature of service, convenience, and access will change dramatically. The rise of Asia, led by China, will change the basis of consumption, infrastructure, city growth, companies. This will be a huge opportunity. Reduction in poverty and the great possibilities for social infrastructure and fairness in health and in, and in education will provide great opportunities. On the threat side, new superpower rivalry of a kind which will be played out not in the Cold War but in the Cyber War. Stridency in rhetoric in democracies which will need to create polarization to stay in power. And there is no easy going away from this. This will just accentuate. Social media versus facts. Today there is no fact. There is just consensus opinion of small groups of people. There is no fact. And there is no way to get that fact. Cyber and nuclear miscalculations will, will be possible. And the geopolitical reset will kill multilateralism and will actually require countries to be agile in finding their space in the world. So when I'm asking you to look beyond the curve, I'm actually asking you to do an emotional experiment. Stay optimistic. Thank you.